from the iHeartRadio studios in New York City. Come two diehard fans of the greatest rock and roll band hailing from Hollywood, California. Dissecting all things Guns N' Roses and anything else in their distorted minds, it's Brando and Scotto. And this is Appetite for Distortion. And welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion. It is episode 39. My name is Brando. With me is my partner in perfect crime, Scott O, comma, Ian. What's going on, Air Jordan? <laughs> Oh, nothing much, man. Yes, I am wearing Jordans today. Uh, no, I'm I'm psyched, man. I'm very amped to have Darren Miller on the podcast, who I've been saying hopefully calls in. We think because um, if I remember correctly, and I may ask him about this, I, I believe Darren is so anti like new technology that I don't even think he owns a cell phone. So uh, it's it's very hard to get a hold of him other than Facebook Messenger. So. Uh, we will see. Uh, I, I love his work with CKY, currently in 96 Bitter Beings, his uh, current band. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm psyched to have him on. So am I, because the last time I saw CKY was, I think, yep. 15 years ago. The anniversary recently came up of the uh, the ill-fated Chinese Democracy Tour. Uh, of course, GNR was on tour with CKY and Mi- uh, Mixmaster Mike from the Beastie Boys. And uh, I got to see Axel finally. Uh, after you know my entire life, never seeing him, and he was quite different with the jerseys and the, you know, the the braids and all that fun stuff. CKY was great though, uh, but again, the next show, that's when it all went to shit at Philadelphia. Yeah. So it must uh, have been so weird because I've read the recaps of how like Mixmaster Mike is out there saying Axel Rose is backstage, he's going to be out in 15 minutes. Like 15 minutes go by, Axel Rose, you know, it, it has to be so weird because I know what it is being like on the floor for a GNR, no matter what the lineup is at that time and like you are just so full of adrenaline so amped for them to come out and i couldn't imagine them not coming out it's uh it was something that was a point of contention with axel rose for many many years and now they're coming on uh you know prime time even before Early. prime time yeah. seven o'clock uh so it's pretty cool so i hope he does uh call up <laughs> you know. i hope he doesn't pull a old axel rose yeah so it's gonna be cool and the reason why we got uh, darren miller um i hate to say this because i said to ian well, we always conversed on what guests we want to do, what topics we want to do for the uh, the show. But I said to Ian, whatever you want to do, whoever you want to speak to for your final episode. Yeah. I don't like that. No, well, that it's makes good, me, it's a little sad. It's a little sad. No, all good. Dude. But no, it's going to be uh, – it's cool. So I'm, I'm looking forward to – you know, this this last, I, I don't want to say last, I'd like to think you'll make some <laughs> Izzy appearances later on uh, yeah, as this continues, but uh, it is uh, pretty cool, and I wish you were part of the, actually, the, the last two episodes. So let's get into uh, a little, you know, our itinerary, which sure. we call Shotgun News. All right. News. First, uh, last episode, uh, episode 38, I'm going to have to, I guess, really specify as we keep going up in episodes. Yeah. Of, it's just unbelievable. Uh, I really have to thank Don Jameson, uh, of course, from that metal show, uh, comedian, rock and roll comedian, and Alex Grassi, of course, from uh, Quiet Riot, Hookers and Blow, who uh, came on, uh, who dealt with my uh, my little health issue the first time, which I did not agree with some uh, chicken parm. Hmm. So I, I we had to reschedule. Uh, they were just great, and they will be coming back on the show hopefully next time in in studio when uh, Hookers and Blow. Uh, cu- blow into town. So Don Jameson, I got to see prior to that metal show. I remember I saw Jim Brewer play what is now the PlayStation Theater. It was at the time Nokia Theater in Times Square. What is it now? Is it PlayStation Theater? PlayStation now? Theater, okay. I, I believe. I think so. Um, was there also like the, so the, many the WWE World yes, once? Okay, yeah. it was something. I else think I saw too. Hoobastank there once. Yeah, it changed, it changed <laughs> a few times. So it was Jim Brewer. And, um, you know, Billy Mirror from the Howard Stern Show actually made an appearance. Okay. And, uh, and uh, Jim Florentine. But this was uh, Jim uh, – sorry, D- Don Jameson was there as well before he was, like, this known entity. And then a couple years later, that metal show happens, which was pretty cool to see. It is really cool, and especially since he's quasi-local, uh, yeah. New Jersey. Although it's not on anymore. I don't – I you know, I know he's just doing stand-up dates. I don't know if he has any, like, big things. Uh, well, right now it's doing the dates with Hookers and Blow. Very I mean, cool. He's obviously doing comedy. I think he, he does uh, – well, you're more of a Met fan. He does uh, Sports Money on SNY. Nice. Like, well, that's um, a cool show. 
Uh, well, I'm a Yankee fan, so I, I don't watch uh, the Mets <laughs> channel. Um, and he, he said, I mean, if you didn't listen to the last episode, that him, uh, Eddie, and Jim are ready to go whenever they get the call. And we had a really big discussion on why, you know, rock and roll is just looked down upon in this world of, of media and TV. There's so much shit out there, especially with Netflix and Hulu. And, you know, you can have YouTube Red TV shows. Why wouldn't the base of that metal show, which has nearly a million Facebook likes, you know, have an audience, and it should. Yeah. And we discussed, of course, to tie it all back in the Guns of Roses. Don said, "Quoting: You would have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to not see what Guns N' Roses just did without a new album. With all, you know, is this going to work? Look what they just did: yeah. Turtle the the world twice. So it's a." It was a great interview with Don. Uh, that was the first part of the episode, and then uh, Alex called in Alex Garassi, who I know you met. Yeah, well, and also just to wrap up that, I was sure. going to say Eddie Trunk. You know that man is super busy. You know between he's now doing a show on Sirius XM Volume where he's discussing all different types of stuff. I think it's like three hours. Then he's got his show on Sirius XM Ozzy's Boneyard, and he's always doing dates with. Uh, he- you know, other bands. He said he's working on a memoir finally. You know, he he's should. Done a, he's I know done a he... couple of books, but not about himself. This one's going to be about him. So he, in particular, I wonder if he could even handle doing that metal show right now. He's a just very busy guy. Well, I'm always seeing Eddie because uh, the AFD show follows him on uh, Twitter, hopefully getting a notice one time. And I would, uh, at some point, I would love to talk to, to Eddie. He's not just being a, a radio guy, but just his interactions with the. Uh, with Gene R, but uh, I, I see them all. I've seen them all say that they are all ready if and when they get the call. And uh, Don said maybe because he wanted part two of that Axel and yes DJ Ashba interview. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that that may kick off the rebirth of me- that metal show if and when it happens. Nice. I would like to say when. Uh, but Al, tell me about because uh, I could not go with you. Yeah. Or you, I don't know, did not invite me to go. Well, I, I spent two nights in I Connecticut, know. so you know it was like it was a solo trip. I just wanted to. Yeah, you know, so that's why I kind of I poked fun of you a little bit uh, with Alex Grassi as far as to why I did not go with you. Yeah. And I said uh, you were taking the the Mensa test. Yeah, which was interesting, man. We'll see how <laughs> I did, and you know it was actually just me too. And they were like, wow, you know, it was like this older woman who was the proctor, and she was like, came all the way out from New York, and I was like, yeah, well, I love going to Mohegan son made a trip out of it and it was fun um that's uh it's an interesting experience but of course uh since we both went to Hofstra university i don't know we'll, we'll see your test results yeah man you're we'll smart see. you're a smart man <laughs> mensa we'll see. i we'll see i i don't i don't <laughs> think i am i just i've always wanted to know what my iq is and i haven't taken an iq test since i was like a child uh, so. i feel like if i took one of those i guess would have felt dumb we'll you know? see man um well, all right so so dizzy reed interesting show uh it was especially Odd just because of the fact that originally Steve Stevens was supposed to play that night. And Steve Stevens canceled for whatever reason. So they had Dizzy Reed play two nights at Mohegan Sun at the Wolf Den. He played Friday night. He played Saturday night. From what I hear, Friday night was a bigger turnout because that was scheduled to happen. Saturday night was almost like last minute, a few days in advance. That's mm-hmm. what they changed it to. Alex didn't even seem to know why or what happened. I asked. I told him what you said, that you went up there to see Steve Stevens. Uh, no offense there. You know. <laughs> no, and I, but when, it, it, when, it, when it I was, heard it was Dizzy Reed, I'm like, all right, awesome. It was that's a cool. blessing anyway. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was. That's just it's, it's it's interesting. So I think because of the fact that it was like a last minute thing, it was honestly a very low turnout. Um, there were definitely some GNR diehards there, diehards in attendance though that I talked to, and it was cool. Um, I've seen Dizzy play before. Uh, you know. Great time seeing these guys play in such a smaller venue to such a more intimate setting. Frank, I have to say, who was on drums. Yeah, I was Frank really Carr, surprised. Uh, he has an awesome stage presence, no matter if he's playing to tens of thousands of people or playing to a handful of people, like he kind of was that night. He, you know, he's just a consummate professional, I guess I would say. And uh, I got to get a picture with them after the show. Uh, my biggest critique, though, to be honest, is that so they're playing in front of a very different crowd because of the fact that they're playing at a casino. So everybody in the casino could hear them. Um, and I honestly, I've never seen a band like that in a casino. I'm not going to lie. The only casino I've ever been in was in Quebec. Sure. It was all in French. I had no idea what was <laughs> going on. So, like, what is it? Just like, are people playing games while the band is yeah. back there? Okay. Yeah. I mean, so it's not a separate theater. No, it's inside the casino, but there is a floor and all that, which usually is to capacity very early on for this show. It was not, once again, probably because of the late booking, not to mention the weather. 
You know, there was also the snowstorm. Oh, yeah. So I think a lot of people bailed because of that. Um, so I was able to be on the floor. Normally, that's a tough thing to do. Mm. Uh, yeah, when you were t- uh, texting me pictures, I was like, whoa. Yeah. You're pretty close. Yeah, I got some great and pictures. And we have them up on, our, up, yeah, uh, Facebook up on and Facebook Twitter. on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, so back to what I was saying, though, with uh, with the show itself, there's people that are watching from the casino who are not really familiar with Dizzy Reed. You know, they're hearing these songs they know, like Sweet Child of Mine and Welcome to the Jungle and all this stuff. And uh, my worry is almost that I think a lot of these people who are just casually watching are like, who is this guy? And they probably would assume that he's part of a Guns N' Roses cover band. Mm-hmm. So I, I wish I would have seen a little bit more interaction from Dizzy saying, like, hey, I was here, you know, especially the song's Unusual Illusion. Hey, I was here when we wrote this. Like a storyteller's uh, kind of thing? Yeah, ju- and also just to let people know that, hey, I, I'm a part of Guns N' Roses. <laughs> you know, because there were some people even That kind of sucks, though, that he should have to say that after all these years, but I do get it. He's not as recognizable, certainly, it was weird, as though, Slash or Axel himself. There were people who worked at the venue who were asking me, they were like, who is this guy? And I'm like, Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses. And they're like, oh, I only like, you know, the older band. And I'm like, well, he was in the older band. You know, he was in, he was on Usual Illusion, yeah, all, yeah. all that. They're like, oh, there was keyboards back then? And I'm like, yes, he was on keyboards back then. Mm. And and Dizzy Reed is the longest fucking member of the group it's, other than Axl Rose. Like, the igno- give him some damn respect. I know, it's the ignorance of the masses and things that we talk about that... The, the dumbest fan at least knows the band, knows a handful of songs, and knows Axel and Slash. It sucks yeah. that Dizzy, you know, he gets no respect. You know, he's, he's the <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield, uh, seems to be, of GNR. And he, and he should, especially since Hookers and Blow have been around for 15 years. I've heard of, of his side project for literally as long as Chinese Democracy was coming out. Yeah, so it was, a, it was a strange setting, and I couldn't help but think, like, that these two guys in the band, you know, and they also had a... Uh, not including Alex, you know, but uh, also a uh, female bass player who was really uh, phenomenal. I thought it was pretty cool. Was Chips, uh, Chips Enough wasn't there, right? No, no. Okay, because they explained it. It's like one of those um, Camp Freddy kind of bands where people kind of just join. And Because I said, uh, you know, that's kind of cool that, that Frank went up there because I was shocked and you yeah. were shocked. And Alex was like, I was shocked. I had no idea. So, the, the you know, what was interesting is, like, these two guys, Frank and Dizzy, they're they're fresh off of playing arenas, playing stadiums, and now they're playing this, you know, pretty small crowd at Mohegan Sun, and I just couldn't help but think of that. It's got to be a strange departure, and it was also, like, a reminder of uh, the being on the road rock star thing is not always this glamorous thing. Like, I would not consider that a glamorous show. It was a more <laughs> intimate show with a smaller crowd, and... Uh, I I enjoyed it, you know, um, but it it also reminded me that Axl Rose, uh, you know, I'm very biased towards Axl Rose, but is the most important member of that band. Because, sure, I mean that goes without, without saying. Well, I think there's well, some people I almost say that. look at Slash. Yeah, as, I and, stopped myself mid sentence. I'm like, and, wait a minute, there are people who would argue that. And what made me think of it? So Mohegan Sun has an arena, and then they have the Wolf Den, which is inside the casino. And I thought to myself, if Axl was playing with any lineup, he'd be playing at the arena. It'd very likely be sold out. I don't think Slash would be playing the arena solo or Duff McKagan's Loaded. They'd be playing the Wolf Den. Well, I don't know about Slash. I mean, he's, I think, more than any other member has has kind of shown what he can do solo. Sure, but uh, at least in the U.S. I I, could see him and Miles Kennedy doing that. I I don't know because in the U.S., and you could tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think Slash, Velvet Revolver has, I don't think Slash has ever headlined an arena tour. Headlined? No. That's oh, what there, I mean. Oh, okay. I'm thinking maybe that I'm familiar with just because it's New York City was uh, Terminal Five. Yeah, but it's a you know it's still a, a smaller venue. It's not an arena, right? You know, right. I don't think you'd ever see Slash play NASA Coliseum, for example. Guns and Roses. No. Whether it's Axl Rose with any member, he's going to play an arena. And to me, what guitar? Know, I'm trying to think of what guitar player can get away with that. Can do that. Can fill an arena that kind of transcends. He's also a front man as well. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Unless it's a you know, a, a, would a Jimmy Page? I don't know. Yeah, it's, 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 if Eddie Van Halen went completely solo, you know. Yeah, and, and Van Hagar. I mean, I feel like people. The draw is Eddie Van Halen. I don't know. Uh, they all. Those are these are things <laughs> to ponder. This is why we, you know, uh, have this podcast. And those are things that we discussed. Uh, with Alex, and because uh, I said, why you know you're part of a, a big band as well with him with Quiet Riot, you know you don't have to do this, and I think it's just it's fun for the band to do. It's fun to be 
in hookers and blow. So uh, definitely check out uh, that last episode if you haven't already. And, you know, I know that there's certain listeners who don't like when we get into the business stuff, but I'm going to. When you say, like, he doesn't have to do it, from what I know, and I've talked to Mark Slaughter about this, like, those are re- those um, casino shows are like a big payday. Yeah. Even if it's a smaller audience because they need entertainment there. So what is it, like a uh, like a cruise for a comedian? You know, it may, may, may not be the most glamorous, but it pays well. Yeah, I, I mean, Mark Slaughter has told me, you know, because Slaughter doesn't tour anymore, and they really do that casino circuit on weekends. And he's like, yeah, throughout the week I do my thing, and then they fly us out to some casino on the weekend, and they they make a lot of money for it. You know, he's told me before that, like, the music business, album sales and all that, not where they are, but, like, they're getting paid more money to do shows in many cases than they were in their heyday, so. Yeah, no, uh, it's I suppose. Obviously, Quiet Riot is not the same, but they still, they're on all these festivals, on these, all these uh, rock cruises, so they're still a name. So, I mean, I'm not, I wasn't going to ask him about his personal finances. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is interesting. Good. Same thing with just, are you doing it? I mean, he also did explain, like, his career coming up, and I think he, he uh, Alex Rossi felt his first big break was uh, recording with with Gilby and we talked we nice. spoke about with him that he has worked with a lot of people has a really good back of his baseball card for an analogy and all those stats <laughs> I mean so is like, the reason I guess every musician has a different reason why they they do these kind of things so yeah. uh no it is cool and um I know you wanted to be part of this interview but it was kind of uh the one before uh but it was kind of impromptu and way too early in the morning oh, and that would be with uh Scott Ian um, I know you listened to it. Yes, I did. I'm just curious as your response to when I wished him a happy Hanukkah. I was actually going to mention that very thing. So yeah. I was I was very surprised by the response. So growing up a Jewish kid in Long Island on Long Island, I always heard about you know Scottian and you know you mentioned some special he was uh, on matzah and metal. But it, it was a, spe- a special on VH1. It was him, D. Snyder, who's half Jewish. Uh, Leslie the West from Mountain, Getty Lee from Rush, of course, and I think there was a couple other people. So I remember I had this book called Jews Who Rock, yeah. and he was in it. <laughs> and so I think his um, his perspective on this is like newer, which is cool. I think it's great when people evolve. Um, but from what I remember in the '90s, early 2000s, he was always like this proud. Openly, I'm Jewish rocker. That's what I thought too. Not like a practicing, but no. just you know, like how I am. Like it's the culture. Yeah, you, you have know? tattoos with uh, you know, he were writing. Sup, Jew. I I think he's. Uh, I always thought of him in that same vein. So this might be a change in perspective, which I think is cool and uh, maybe in- interesting thing. He mentioned that Jim and Andy documentary yep. on Netflix, which I heard great things about. It was, it was good. And that, I'm surprised you haven't seen it yet. I have. Oh, you have. That okay. put me over the edge to seeing it when he said how great oh. it was. I was like, you know what? I'm finally going to check this out. I watched it last night, and it was really well done, man. And you really, if you haven't watched it, you will respect Jim Carrey as an actor so much. How much oh, dedication he puts into totally different, his roles. and that goes on to you know something else we've spoken about on the show or documentaries. You know, uh, sla- uh, Duff's is out there, yeah. uh, and what we what do we want from a GNR one if it ever does happen? You know, all those unreleased videos from the uh, User Illusion era. So uh, it's it's cool, and we've discussed you know Lady Gaga's new one, uh, but this was a unique perspective, and again, it just makes me think of. You know, I want to hear the philosophy of the guys in the band. So I guess it's just another reminder to myself. Like, I want more from the Guns N' Roses, and there's so much more to find out. But that is very cool that Scott Ian put you over the edge to go see. Uh, yeah, that uh, and the, Man I, of the Moon or whatever. Oh, Jim and Andy, right? Jim, yeah, that that uh, story of the ten million dollar check. I won't give the whole thing away. Uh, but I've heard him tell that story before. I think he told it with, like, Jim Norton in an interview. Possibly. And yeah. that really is an amazing story, I think. And I've, you know, doing uh, one of the podcasts, I do The Power of Thought with Brandon Webb. We interview, like, all these thought leaders and, and people who have, like, excelled in their careers. And there's always a lot of common thread, and I think that that whole idea of, like, visualizing this is where I want to be and truly believing it, uh, I hear from so many people, regardless of what field they're in, if they become – a major success the way he has. Sure. I mean, those people, like, that does exist. You have to visualize it. But something else we've discussed on this show uh, was the decline of Western civilization and those people who, in the, in the failed, you know, uh, hair metal era, also really believed it and envisioned it. And, and now, I don't know, we're stockbrokers or, or, or something. <laughs> I wonder. It, so it, it, it always depends. It just, it's just, it's very, it's an interesting perspective. And uh, especially when we got to talk about, 
you know, Guns N' Roses and that bounces off to Jim and Andy or like with Alex, it bounced off to, uh, you know, Festivus, uh, you know, because his mom actually has a Festivus poll. So it's just kind of cool where we can go with the, this Guns N' Roses podcast, uh, jumping off the GNR uh, trampoline. So uh, I'm trying to, where was that thing I was going to bring up again for, for Shotgun News? Yeah, I think it, you have to reload it on the page, but you opened up those Forbes top earners uh, in music. Yes, exactly. Uh, I So GNR, this was, I guess, the, last year's total earnings from- um, That's what it would believe. That's what it looks like. You pulled it up before I did, but I mean, yeah, let's yeah, get into uh, it. Highest paid musician. So he only gives the top 10, uh, number 10, Metallica, number nine, Adele. Uh, number eight, Springsteen. Spoke about him, of course, many times in the show. Bru- uh, Bieber, right above Bruce. And and Bruce, he has that show on Broadway, right? So I believe that probably factors in. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Who did I see that just saw that? And then a pop-up just came Oh, uh, Chad Smith, who I met recently from the uh, Chili Peppers, uh, saw the Springsteen show on Broadway and said it was amazing. Uh, sorry, I had a name drop there. And, of course— That's what I said. I said a pop-up came up. <laughs> well, I'm half listening. All right, so after— uh, Bieber and number seven, Guns N' Roses. Yeah, and number six. And, and wait, look at look at the amount too. Eighty four million, which is not that far behind the rest of the people we're going to mention. Which I don't. It bothers me. Coldplay is above them at eighty eight million. I don't. I don't understand that at all. To me, Coldplay, they you know they reached their peak. You know, and, people and, still. And that was the song that they ripped, ripped off of Joe Satriani, <laughs> which is ugh, yeah. What? People still are seeing him, man. Uh, the weekend, who I mean, just wants to be Michael Jackson. So he, <laughs> he, we won't hear of him in in ten years, if that long. It's just another person. With I, an I don't know. Date. I feel like I uh, I don't want to make that statement because I don't. You know, I know. But I and and Art uh, Tavana, our buddy, says the opposite to me. He's like he argues like as long as you have social media, you can survive. But I just think. It depends. People, I could tell you, like, it's so saturated. I, I think, know. like, Cardi B, one hit wonder. I mean, like, I've only known the name because of stupid, like, Facebook. It's, Cardi B. It's literally, like, the biggest song right now, though. Cardi Bodak B. Bodak Yellow. It, it just, like, it sounds like a vitamin. <laughs> well, she was a stripper. Even better. Even fucking better. Well, that's not true. I have friends who are strippers, so there's nothing wrong with that. I didn't, I didn't say anything was wrong. Uh, well, it sounded like I implied it, so I didn't <laughs> want that. Uh, above uh, that is uh, Drake's Coffee Cakes. Uh, Drake. Who I will always remember uh, as uh, Aubrey uh, yeah. from uh, Degrassi. Well, okay, so I'm not <laughs> I'm not surprised with Drake on there. No, he's pretty big above that. Beyonce, I'm not a fan at all. People uh, love her. You don't get the I, I, Bayhive I, or whatever. Yeah. It says. <laughs> <laughs> I like Rihanna more. Uh, they 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 flame Art Tavana when Art is like who he always says Taylor Swift is better and yeah. those people like uh, he loves pushing buttons though. I I love it. Our buddy uh, who has uh, Art says he has some uh, surprising news for we Guns N' Roses fans as he's working on his book. So definitely he follow loves Art it though. Like he'll purposely post at that and wait for them to be like you're a racist or like Taylor Swift over Beyonce and he loves it he loves the attention because it's it's not even like you're you're poking fun at somebody like I, I just don't even know like it's not even worth it they're like they're dumb people I don't have that kind of energy <laughs> it's not, whatever uh follow Artaban on Twitter uh and then of course I guess coming in number one um I guess he changed his name back from Brother Love to uh, to Diddy I think it just says Diddy on there, but uh, yeah, so I didn't even know Diddy was doing anything. I think it, I, it was the bad. Was it the Bad Boys tour or something like that? Oh, that's probably what it is. So okay. I, I thought you were down. Do you know these things? I just I forgot about it, but that's that but, makes sense then. And but Diddy, many, yeah, Diddy's so many, a businessman, so he probably took the lion's share of that. <laughs> I, I guess so, but that's the only recent bit of uh, shotgun news as far as Guns N' Roses, and it's very cool. Still, top ten. They came in at number six. I mean, you can argue. You know, million. whether they should be higher over these other acts or lower, but I think it's very impressive that this band did very little um, promotion, no new music to promote, and look what they did. Look what they did. And the, the, Killing it, it. Damn straight. And the phone is now lighting up. I think we should answer this. Uh, Darren, hey. How you doing? I'm doing, I'm doing good, good, dude. I'm here with uh, Brandon. We're, uh, we're psyched to do this. We got worried for a second there. Yeah, I tend to worry people. So joining us for the first time on Appetite for Distortion is Darren Miller. Most of you probably know him best from CKY, currently the frontman for 96 Better Beings, uh, which is, you know, I guess you would say a, a spinoff of CKY since CKY has continued without you, despite you being the primary songwriter and, and the guy who sang and played guitar on every song. So, <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Um 
You know, I don't see it that way necessarily. I just see, you know, 96 Bitter Beings as, you know, the song that, you know, put us on the map, put, certainly put me on the map as a songwriter. It's the most listened to, downloaded uh, song, you know, streamed song that I've ever done. So I thought it also makes for a good band name. Yeah. So basically I'm just doing what I would have done if I had still been in that band. Where where do you find the other guys? Because you know, I think we'll get into maybe the parallel of of what you're going through and maybe what Axel Rose went through. And of course, I want to get into you guys touring. But where do you find mm. these newer guys? Because they're all much younger. You know, I have I have about fifty bands going on at once. <laughs> and usually, what I do is like if I'm looking for somebody, I'll put it out there. You know, and the person that like hassles the most, the person that causes the most you know, attention for me to, you know, obviously there are people that are like, try me, try me. And, you know, something's not right either. You know, they're not, they're not local or they might not be good enough or they might not, you know, whatever the case is. Somehow, like I've always been able to find people, you know, there's people that really want to do this. And I found Sean through um, putting it out there that I need, needed a bass player and then Dave Sudak um, was working with Esoteric Guitars, so a new company at the time that was making guitars. And um, he put me in touch not only with Esoteric, but with um, Kenneth Hunter, who started Manifestation uh, Productions, an amazing studio over in Lake Forest, California. So through all these like, you know, meetings. One thing led to another. Dave Sudak was playing with us for a while. <clears throat> he announced that you know, he had to do some. He wanted to go into uh, training to be a police officer. He did that for a while. We we got Kenneth on guitar instead of just you know being uh, an engineer, a producer, or whatever. We also added him into the band, and then Tim's brother, or Sean's brother, Tim, was a drummer, but he kind of. You know, he he when he played with us, he just kind of insinuated himself. It was interesting. He we were just jamming, and we're like, "Oh, what, what are we going to do about a drummer?" And and Sean's little brother Tim comes in and says, "Hey, I'll play on a couple tracks." And you know, he he was okay. You know, I was like, "But you know, we still got to find a drummer." And then he just kept rehearsing with us, and then he got better and better and better and better. And now he's probably one of the best rock drummers I've ever heard in my life. That's awesome. So it's just like, you know, the um the enthusiasm about wanting to do it, I think is is what brings people into your life, you know. Just the energy, the positive the energy, the positive energy that you put out there that you want to do something creative and you want to, you know, get going, certain people will continually show up, you know, in your life. They'll continually I call it insinuating yourself. It's kind of like edging your way in but not in a bad way, you know, it's, it's, I've been insinuating myself into things for years, you know, and that's how I, I get to where I want to be and what I want to get, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. So it just works really uh, well that way. I kind of want to know, uh, cause Ian, I mean, I, I'm a fan of CKY. We both are obviously, but Ian is a little bit more in depth than I oh, yeah. am. So I want to know a little bit more about your, uh, your upbringing and how you got to be, where you are now, you know, how, uh, I mean, did you, you grew up in, in, uh, Westchester or, or that area? I grew up in Marlton, New Jersey. Okay. And, you know, aside from a really good friend, a couple of really good friends that I still keep with me today, I was a lonely kid. I mean, I, I was weird. I wasn't into all the things that, you know, the other kids were into, you know, the baseball and the football and my, my parent, my dad, you know, was worried about, me just being interested in, in music that he didn't understand. So I was, you know, sometimes put on to sports teams and I didn't do well and I was made fun of. And, and it was really difficult because if you're doing something you don't want to do all around other people that do want to do it and you're not good at it, 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 there's nothing good that can come out of that, you know. I didn't want to be there. They didn't want me to be there. And we all made it very clear, you know. And as a kid, it's really hard, you know. Parents pay a lot more attention to that stuff now because it's, it's very important on who you become later on. 
Um, if you're not allowed to express yourself or if, you know, you're not encouraged to express yourself in what you're doing and what you're interested in and parents don't understand, oh, you know, my son – likes to put on kiss makeup and, and look <laughs> in the mirror and, you know, like that's not, they don't see that as something with any potential. So naturally, you know, it took a lot of time and, and it, a lot of work. And I just basically, I stayed to myself. I, I got a guitar, I got an amp and I just went to work. I mean, my, the story is very similar to anyone else's that you read. I mean, it's the same as Paul Stanley, you know. If you read his book, it's just about him sitting in his room playing guitar and being picked on by everybody, and that's pretty much it. It's an yeah, excellent book, by the way. And, and Oh, I love it. Speaking yeah, about, like, mani- mirror- I was going to say, speaking of, like, manifesting things, like you went on to work with them, I know, and you're, like, the biggest Kiss fan. I never went on to work with Kiss, but I did meet... All of them except for Ace. I thought you did for some reason. I don't know. I so he's not as big of a CKY <laughs> fan as I thought. Okay. Well, I ended, <laughs> CKY ended up on the same record label as Kiss, and that therefore might be we, what it is. Yeah. we had some benefits um, with concerts. You know, I went to a couple concerts. The last one with Peter Chris actually when they played with Aerosmith, and Peter is just a funny guy. <laughs> you know, having like standing next to him in. Uh, Seven inch heels and and kiss makeup, him not me, um, <laughs> him still being you know shorter than than we were, you know and and I was just talking to him about you know how cool it is that he came back to the band and he he said something like these fucks would put anybody in my makeup <laughs> and it was just bizarre because you know those problems were not public yeah nobody knew that they were having in, like internal turmoil because they like to keep that stuff quiet until five years later. You know. I, I think the interesting thing about CKY is just, you know, you guys became so associated with the CKY videos and then Jackass that I feel like you, you guys never got the recognition you deserved as musicians or you as well, a songwriter. Because you're one of my favorite songwriters, honestly. And, and oh, I do tell you. people when people are saying, oh, CKY is currently touring. Like, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you wrote every CKY song except for Afterworld. I wrote half of that. <laughs> okay, so, so there you go. <laughs> I wrote I wrote the music for that, and when I I went out for a pizza, literally went out for a pizza, and when I had come back, there were vocals on the song, and that that's Jeez. fine, you know. That's kind of what I wanted. I used to beg for it because whenever the record company would would give us our advance back in those days, they called it an advance. Um, you were, you know, given an advance and then expected to hand something in. And I remember being excited and both scared at, that, all right, now I have to come up with an album, you know. And I always, you know, wanted to reach out and get somebody to help, but it never happened. It never happened in, what, four albums, five albums? So, lyrically... There's a couple things. Um, they stand out like a sore thumb to me whenever I hear them. They're words I wouldn't write, but mm. yeah, yes, I mean, I'm not. I, I like to take credit for things that I've done. I don't want to take credit for other people's things. I get no satisfaction out of that. You know, if you painted a, a house and somebody that was with you eating sandwiches the whole time <laughs> says, "Oh yeah, we painted the house," you kind of be like, you're kind of going to be like, wait a minute. What? You know, <laughs> that's not cool. Yeah. No, I completely so, get it. No, I wasn't out there to ever accept credit for something that I didn't do. I, would, I had to fight to get credit for things that I did do. And that was frustrating. Yeah, it has to be. Um, so fast forwarding ahead a bit, since, you know, this is, of course, Appetite for Distortion and, and we like to talk Guns and Roses. What was yeah. the origin of you guys getting on the tour with Guns and Roses? And what was the whole atmosphere like? Because... This is when people were saying, this is Axl Rose and Friends. This isn't Guns N' Roses. And not everybody mm-hmm. was so accepting of seeing Buckethead and, and these other guys up there playing the music of Guns N' Roses. And I will preface it that I did see the last show on that Chinese Democracy tour when you mm-hmm. played uh, Madison Square Garden. And then everything went to hell uh, after that. <laughs> yeah, so well, I did get to see action. you. I, don't, I didn't know what happened to Madison Square Garden. I, I'm happy to say that I, you know, my band was playing had you know had almost headlining Madison Square Garden, but they did show up. 
at the last minute at <laughs> Guns N' Roses. But the next night in our hometown at the First Union Center, First Union Center, I believe it's called, not anymore, I don't know. But um, I used to go to concerts there, and we played a sold-out First Union Center. We headlined because Guns N' Roses never showed up. Now, I can't tell you specifically why these things happened, why the concerts were always delayed, why, you know, I, I didn't think there was anything wrong with Axel going out with, you know, different members of the band, you know, different people that he had gotten. Because I understand that. You, fans want a certain band to to be a certain way. And then there you have to understand that there's a relationship there. It's kind of like, you know, you're a kid and you want your parents to stay together. And you don't understand why they're not, right. you know, some kids. But they understand it. But later on, maybe you'll figure it out. But they're, they can't be together. It's better off for them to not be together. And then hopefully down the line, you you hope maybe they'll work things out and they'll get back together again, you know. But from from a member of a band's perspective, there's a reason. It could be legal, it could be personal, it could be anything that these people cannot be that band that you once cherished, you know. And for them, it was just he didn't want to, I guess, play with the other guys. They were in some kind of fight, you know, they were doing their thing with Scott Whalen, um Velvet Revolver, I think it was called. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, they he decided to do a tour and um they sounded amazing. Yeah, absolutely. They could not complain about the the, the sound. I Buckethead I think is one of the greatest guitarists ever. I mean, we talk yeah, about this on the show mm-hmm. constantly. Yeah. He he was really good. I mean, he he didn't even need to, to see. He had a, a goddamn bucket over his head. <laughs> you know, his depth perception must have been terribly off. You know, and you can't play guitar like that. It's, but he can. Did, so. did you have any interaction with the guys, with Axel? And... I had interaction with Brain and Axel, and that was it. So tell us about and that. And it's interesting because you think Guns N' Roses threw, Guns N Roses threw parties after every single show. And the only person that showed up and stayed the entire time was Axel. <laughs> now, I don't know if the other guys were like, uh, fuck this, you know. But he was the only one that would stick around and talk to anybody that had gotten a pass to go back to that party. So I found that to be very, you know, noble, and I admired that. Because he could have very easily avoided anyone, you know. Yeah. I'm getting that, and, st- that, that that vision in my head in uh, Wayne's World where they have the passes and they're going back to see Alice Cooper and they're kind of afraid. But he's like, nah, come hang out with us. You're cool. Alice, is this cool? Mark, check these yeah, come on in. It was exactly like that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly like that. And, and it, it, he, goes, he, it goes against the whole narrative that he's an asshole. Well, that's the problem that I've had with, with you know, social media and, and any kind of media distorts things and they turn these rumors into horrible truths that you know sometimes i guess they're right i mean harvey weinstein did what harvey weinstein did but Mm -hmm. who knows if it's blown out of proportion who knows if they're telling the truth you know same with bill cosby you know you get caught up into this bullshit social media thing that starts out as a rumor and then all of a sudden people just believe it and you know, on a smaller scale, of course, that's more criminal. But on a smaller scale, Axl Rose being a douchebag and Axl Rose not being cool to other people and treating people like shit, that certainly was not true in my case and everyone around. I did not, I did not see any of that. That's great. Anything because... close to that. In fact, if you hadn't recognized him, you, would just, you just would have thought he was a cool guy that had gotten to the party hmm. every night. And that was it. Because it's interesting, because you'll find out, I think uh, Alice and Shane's even said that uh, after when they first toured with GNR in the recent uh, Not In This Lifetime, that uh, I think William Duvall is like, I haven't even met Axel yet. So that gets out there in, in the news and social media. It's like, oh, these uh, these bands on the bill with GNR, they're not even mm-hmm. meeting the band, and maybe you know Axel's still on his high tower. Uh, but it doesn't seem, that, seem to be that way now or, or back then either. Well, let me tell you something. These people that have and can afford this kind of, you know, backup. Axl Rose, anybody like that, 
they have people that work for them that keep people away. So the attitude and, and, and their behavior, the rumors of the behavior and attitude come from the people that work for them. It never comes from the person. So if somebody says uh, to Allison Chains, oh, get that fuck out of the hallway, Alex is, or Axel is about to walk down the hallway, don't look at him, don't stare at him, chances are it's that guy's idea. Hmm. You know, a lot of these people aren't privy to what the people they're working for are doing to protect them. Some of them go too far. You know, don't talk to Axel if he if he comes by you. Don't talk to, don't look anyone in the eyes if they come out. You know, some of those people, some people are are like that. But mostly, it's the people that work for them, whether it's their bodyguard, it's their promotional team, whoever it is that shows up that works for Guns N' Roses is going to try to make it as comfortable as possible at your feelings expense <laughs> i've experienced you know? that same thing uh, i don't know if you have brando working in radio you know the example that always strikes me i got to meet dave navarro when i was working at sirius xm and mm-hmm. someone from i i think someone must have told uh someone at sirius you know from his team and they relayed to me they were like you know i, I asked if i could get a picture with dave navarro they were like sure whatever you do do not mention the red hot chili peppers he does not want to talk about it and i'm like all right sounds good um mm-hmm. so i did say to him i'm like Hey, just so you know, you know, the first concert I ever went to was one of your gigs. And at that point, he's like, oh, cool, which I'm not going to not say then. So I was like, yeah, so Red Hot Chili Peppers, NASA Coliseum. He remembered the gig. He was like, oh, it was snowing, snowstorm, and almost got, you know, canceled. And I was like, yeah. Uh, took a picture with me, looked at it. He was like, we look handsome. And uh, that was it. So it was definitely right. not something coming from him that you couldn't mention that because he, he didn't have any problem with it whatsoever. So I've experienced that. Exactly. And these people want to keep their jobs, so they want to do the best they can to make that person feel comfortable. You know, somebody might say, don't mention CKY, don't mention <laughs> this, blah, 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 blah. They, they know those might be things I might not want to talk about, but that's just somebody that if I could afford to have somebody, all these people working around me, an entourage or something. You know, that's that's just what they create to protect that person. And it's not always, sometimes it is you do to get assholes like maybe Mariah Carey, who, who, you know, need like 50,000 stuffed animals and only pink <laughs> jelly beans or something. I don't know. I, yeah, I haven't but, heard good things. I had somebody who actually applied to be her babysitter and just the process <laughs> was uh, kind of crazy. I think it was only $80,000 a year to be Mariah Carey's babysitter. Oh, I say oh, only because yeah. it's Mariah Carey. Yeah, it's got to be a tough. That's game. another thing that's that's overlooked and and exaggerated is wealth. You yeah, know? that that is true. Then were you? Um, I mean, if Axel was cool to you, then as far as being a band on that bill, especially when Guns N' Roses were, you know, in hiding in, in a sense, and this was like Axel coming up, sort of like a a dreaded phoenix. But how were you received by fans that? Just like I've been waiting so long to see Axl Rose, but we got to. And here we have this unknown band that has to play first. Yeah, in uh, a sense. In a sense. <laughs> you know what? It wasn't as bad as you might think. There were some nights where, you know, you'd hear something. You know, when I hear something from the audience, unless everybody else hears it, I don't. I don't, you know, pay attention to it. You know, um, and in that, in those cases, you know, it was easy to ignore. You know. There's all kinds of things coming at you from an arena, you know, and people have different personalities in the audience. There are people that want to see Axel and don't want to see the band. There are people that are just there to have a good time. Not everybody's there to cause a problem. But, there, were, you know, yeah, there were some times where I think um, Chad had to throw his guitar up in the second <laughs> balcony of the arena at somebody <laughs> you know and that's that's his behavioral you know problems he doesn't want to hear something from an audience that's negative but you know i just laugh it off because i was the same way i saw trickster open for kiss and i gave the guy from trickster the finger mm. you know i was 13 years old 14 i don't know and you know be, being put in that situation i realized that it probably wasn't a very cool thing for me to do but it was the cool thing to do when you're waiting for the headliner you know oh yeah, the yeah. opening band sucks that makes sense we we just did our show you know was that a dream come true for you guys to be on a bill with a band of that how did that stature? come about definitely you know? yeah how did that come well, about did they reach out to you you were there what happened was it, the, the record company was opposed to it surprisingly for some reason, but we had gotten a phone call saying that we were up for it. Now, I didn't understand how that could be because we were on a tour three months straight 
in the U.S., just about to go home. We had two more dates, and they were in California, close to my house, so I could have, you know, played the two shows, gone home, and had a break. And then we got a phone call that it was between us and seven bands because Axel had seen the Flesh and the Gear video. Hmm. And I forget who the other bands were. I, I, I don't know. Whoever was popular back then at the time. And, um, who was Stank? <laughs> No, it, no, it was. It, I, I guess don't know. I was trying to throw out a name. <laughs> that could have been. I mean, Hoobastank was on our la- was on the same label as us, but um, and we toured with them for. a I don't think they were up for it. I don't know. It could be wrong. But um, I remember it was between us and seven other bands, and I thought, oh god, whatever. You know, this is cool to even be mentioned in seven <laughs> seven different bands, but. I didn't think it was going to happen. Which one of but... you is going to get the rose, like the bachelor? But this time, it's which one of you is right, going to get the axle exactly. rose? Exactly. Right. It was very honoring to be mentioned or even thought about. Hmm. But it's an honor just to be. And I got ex- I got excited about that, you know. But I, I pretty much in my mind, you know, basically in my mind, I can take a, a cool, positive thing and just come to a horrible conclusion. So you and me both. That's what I did. I just said. Oh, that's nice, you know, but we are going to play our two shows and go home. Mm-hmm. Well, we got the phone call that we were on it, and we had to be in Canada in two days by bus. So we were shocked. We, it was like but there was two sides of that. There was, holy shit, we're exhausted from three months of nonstop touring. And then there's, holy shit, we're going to go open for Guns N' Roses. So, of course... No question about it. We had the bus driver turn around, shoot north. You know, we went through customs and everything. And uh, we got to the arena after a long bout with customs. I think we were held up eight hours or something. Mm-hmm. We get to customs, go through there, get to the arena just in time. We were on in 15 minutes. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then the show was canceled. Wow. Because nobody was there from the band so we had an arena filled with people that were pissed off we had to we were interviewed by kurt loader downstairs while this huge um riot was going on outside and we were kind of trapped inside the arena downstairs and kurt loader was interviewing us and and they never aired it and then we got eventually you know, everybody cleared out. We got on our bus, and I think people were throwing rocks at our bus, thinking that we were Guns N' Roses or something. And it was just funny because we had made all these attempts. We had to cancel the last two shows. We had to go all the way up, you know, to Canada in record time and just drive back into the States again. I can't and imagine then, how frustrating that would be. So, I mean, why would you continue to to be on that? Well, it was a laugh, you know. Yeah, I, everybody kind I of. It was kind of like I, you know, it's hard for me to recall a lot of the details of anything. But when we're going back, fifteen years, fourteen years, um, we just said the tour's still on, so we're going to go to the next stop and see how crazy this gets, you know. Fair enough. So I think the next one was like Boise, Idaho or something, and uh, we played. That one went well, you know, and was every Was that night, your first time seeing Guns N' Roses or in that incarnation? Yeah. My first time, yeah. Ever? Ever? Yeah. Oh. So what were your thoughts? First time seeing, not only is opening for them. I but thought it was amazing. Did you? There was no thought of you know, hey, Axel looks different, a different band. You guys, like like you said, with your band, you guys appreciate the vision in in, uh, in good music, right? No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't really a diehard Guns N' Roses fan. I had Appetite for Destruction. I had Use Your Illusions and all that Spaghetti Instant, and all that stuff. But I wasn't like diehard. I just wanted to hear the songs played live, mm-hmm. and they sounded. Amazing. Yeah. You know, there was nothing, there wasn't any difference in quality because of a completely different lineup. Yeah, that's how you I know? felt seeing them. You know, I think the, the later incarnations of the band were excellent. You know, going back to being picked, I, I totally see why Axel felt it was, you know, and if he was the sole guy who made the opinion, uh, made the choice, 
why CKY. That's what would, we heard. Yeah, I get why you would fit as an opener because going back to that time, you know, I remember the big things on the radio were like the whole new metal rap rock thing. There was a lot of alternative rock, and I feel like CKY was one of those few bands like carrying the torch of just true balls to the wall rock and roll. And I think that's what he saw in us because I back then, and I'm sure it still goes on. Bands would buy onto a tour whether mm. they were any good or not. So if a record company, that's why I said the record company was opposed to it. They didn't put in any money to have us be the ones. So that's another admirable thing. Think of all the bands that were happening at that time, you know, that had gold and platinum records that could have opened that tour. And the record company would have coughed up half a million to, to buy onto the tour, maybe more. And he didn't care about the money, he didn't care about who was popular at the time. He probably watched seven videos, you know, didn't like the new metal shit, which a lot of people didn't, and picked us, you know, without making us pay anything, without, you know, we didn't have to go through hoops, you know. It was just, and that's, that's why I have total respect for him. I don't, I don't care what I hear about him. You know, that's so cool. nobody should care what they hear about people because you don't know them. Celebrities have two different lives. They have their human mortal life and how they interact with people. And then they have what people think they've done, what people think they are. And they're two totally different things. And it's tough to have to battle all these rumors and publicly have to battle all these rumors that people have come up about you that are nowhere near true, you know? And, and he's probably, is in the musician world, probably one of the kings of that issue, you know? Because he doesn't, he didn't say anything, you know, he hasn't, what, done an interview in how many years? He's done a few very small ones because of Eddie Trunk. And, and only uh, recently, I think, and last year it was on Brazilian TV with Duff, uh, and, you know, this was right after the tour was uh, announced. But, no, it's been very few and far in between. And something, of course, we've discussed because you you can still try to rectify a rumor. And then in the, in the climate, people could be like, oh, that's a half-assed apology or he's lying. I mean, there's a way to twist it. So yeah. it, it is interesting but because especially when we talk to people like you, there, ever since we've been doing the show, not one person has said anything bad about Axel. And it's not because right. you're, we're on a Guns N' Roses podcast. Uh I I like to think I'm not biased. If someone I respect and admire does something I don't like, I can go sure. that way. But I had the same sentiment with you the entire time as far as uh, Axel. I'm like, I never met the man when people would make right. fun of me. Like, Why are you seeing Guns N' Roses when I went to go see them in 2002 with you? I'm like, right. you know, Axel's a dick. I, is he? I don't know. I never met him. I exactly. No and then it just goes to show like how, how idiotic the public can be by just believing something just because it's posted internationally. Well, you have to find out the credibility of the source. You know, most of the people that run these websites or these, you know, music magazine websites or whatever magazines back then, I don't know. I haven't seen or bought a music magazine in 15, 20 years. Yeah, I don't think many people have. Magazine? <laughs> right. But the credibility of these people that are running them is just, you know, they're lucky to have so many followers and people that are reading them, but they don't necessarily have any credibility as as to what they know or because obviously they're not telling the truth, yeah. you know? And that goes back to like that get in the ring song by guns and roses. Um, I want to draw a parallel to, you know, guns and roses and CKY. I've listened to a bunch of interviews with you just as a fan, Darren. And I, I remember hearing you say that you were like embarrassed with how the afterworld video came out and, you know, soon oh, after yeah. that was your departure from the band and I remember, you know, members of Guns N' Roses feeling that the estranged video was too much Axel's vision. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you balance that whole artistic vision in a band and that type of thing? Especially with you, because you were the sole guy writing the songs, writing the lyrics. Um, so what's mm -hmm. that like when you feel like your vision is not being shown? Well, it, it, most of the time, you know, with the songs that I did want you know, a part in how it ended out, you know, the videos. I, I did basically get what I want. 
what I wanted, and everybody in the band basically got what they wanted. If you watch the videos that we did for um, Infiltrate and Volume 1 for Answer Can Be Found, <laughs> you know, my brother's in the video for, for Familiar Realms, so that one wasn't it any of the band's vision. The Familiar Realm video, aside from my brother being in it, in it, didn't really have anything to do with us. You know, it was um, this up-and-coming director who uh, the record label had sniffed out and wanted, you know, we wanted to play ball. You know, Familiar Realm was a play, play ball with the label kind of song. It's very slow. It doesn't really, I like the, I like the music. I don't really care for the lyrics, you know, I only wrote maybe half of them. Um, basically, the record company wanted us to slow what we were doing down for just one song. You know, we handed in Answer Can Be Found, and it was a CKY record, and there was no compromise except the record company said, just please put one song on there that we can sell to the idiots. You know? <laughs> I like basically, that Basically, that's how it was put. And <laughs> when you're asked to do something like that, it's like, God, you, you kind of feel dirty, you know? I, and, thought, um, I thought Afterworld was the video that you really had a problem with, though. Afterworld is like the tip of the iceberg. I don't even remember much about that video other than that it was going to be shot in Philadelphia, and I didn't feel like flying out for it because I saw what what the plans were for it, and I just – didn't get it, and I, I, you know what, I'll sit this one out. And at that time, you know, I had already been kind of like, not tired of it, but I'd been kind of like, just burned out of of what we were doing because it wasn't progressing. It was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, it was obvious we weren't going to get any bigger as a band. The last. You know, the last shot that we had was the Afterworld single being in Jackass 3D. And I don't know why I had put it in my head. Maybe I had put it in my head, you know, as a as a wish, you know, to pray to, to bring the band back up to something that could be reckoned with. But it had absolutely no effect on our career. The single, uh, the video, it just didn't do anything. So... For me, like I, I'm kind of like a kind, the kind of person that likes if something isn't going to progress or get bigger, then I don't see any point in continuing with it, especially if I'm not happy doing it in at that time with the people that I'm I'm working with. I would start. I'd I'd rather start over with something else than to continue with something that's obviously sinking. It's kind of like the Titanic. It's this huge, beautiful boat, boat, but it's got a hole in it. Now, you could choose to sink with that boat, or you could get in this crummy little shit boat that's probably going to take you home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Then what about so, the, uh, the, like, the name recognition? Something that we've, we've spoken about here on the show. You know, Axel could have put out Chinese Democracy under another name. Uh, you know, with CKY still has a name uh, with that. So did that ever cross? Like, what do you think of, I guess— I, I thought that— the name is only as valuable as what was going on, you know, mm -hmm. and the fans had the ultimate say, Yeah, you know, um, they're either going to accept that or not. And CKY is not Guns N' Roses. Sure. You know? Sure. But I mean, you still got, um, I mean, you, you got like, I'm trying to think of like eighties and nineties bands, you know, I think soul for real or 98 degrees touring. I mean, bands that nobody gives a shit about, <laughs> uh, but it's just some sort of name recognition that you're holding on to with your core fan base. Hey, don't, people I understand do care that. about CKY. Those bands, they, oh yes, of course, of course. <laughs> those bands have, they have, you know, there's something valuable about, valuable about, ELO or the or Sticks or bands that had hits that sure. people want to go and you know my mom tells me oh I went to see ELO, you know but she's not a fan she you know she just remembered from a hit or something. You've been pretty. We vocal. didn't have any hits. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would say you know ninety six quite better being flesh and into gear. gear. You know yeah. there are are smaller hits to an underground. They're audience, still on my but... Spotify. I mean, they were on when the whole days with Lime. I mean, I'm sorry, maybe I owe uh, Darren some money. I probably downloaded that those songs off Napster back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But um, I, what I was going to say is you've been you've been pretty vocal about the current band that's touring as CKY and and how you feel about it. And they've been kind of vocal with you. I know that there's been issues when when you were playing bars in California. I haven't said, I haven't mentioned their name publicly in probably a year. Sure, close to a year. I, I have no idea what they're doing because so just... it hasn't regi- it hasn't registered. It doesn't have any cultural. Um, I can't. So I'm, I'm so bad at thinking nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I get what you mean. There's no and, and, relevancy. There's no cultural relevancy of that band. Yeah. Because, sure, a song can be an underground hit and be even bigger than a real hit, but a hit is a hit on paper. A hit is a hit on a radio station's list. That's a hit. When you get an underground hit like 96 Bitter Beings or Flesh in the Gear, which were ter- they were top 40 rock hits, but they weren't, when it came time to push the song to the next level, which needed financial backing to push Familiar Realm and Flesh into Gear, we were winning, you know, all those contests on radio stations against other bands, you know. We won all of them. But when it, when it came time to retire our song, they stopped playing it and kept playing the one that was getting paid for. The record companies would pay the, the radio stations to play their, their singles. Illegal. We never got that. Yeah. So when our song died from a public point of view, from people calling in and requesting it, it we didn't get that push that we needed to you know, brown nose the radio stations and to keep continuing to play it because they can play whatever they want and turn it into a hit. Does the notoriety thing really bother you, though? Because, you know, I follow your career. You put out an amazing album with World Under Blood. You know, I'm not even a death metal fan, and, and like, that is the one death metal album I'll listen That's to. That's an amazing compliment. Oh, it yeah, because, I, into death metal. because it's almost like cl- clean vocals are, you know, not allowed in death metal. And I, I think it's cool that you towed that line. I love the mm-hmm. Foreign Objects albums. Needless to say, those albums didn't have hits, uh, as well as your acoustic album, but the people uh-huh. who got them absolutely love them, including myself. So, like, does it really matter if a song is a hit to you? No. No, I had no aspirations to be a rock star because my, my idols were not rock stars. Except for My Kiss. idols were eating peanut butter sandwiches in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a van on tour. But I would say Kiss fits the bill, of course. Kiss started with me at two years old. I had no idea what they were. I thought they were real people like that. Yeah. <laughs> I was two years old, and, and Kiss, of course, yeah. But, I mean, if you, see, if, you, if you listen to what Gene Simmons and Ace really have to say now, it doesn't make rock stardom look very appealing. No. You know? You, so you, so you just want to be a touring musician, or did you want to be a rock star? I wanted to be a, a touring star? musician that made ends meet, and could survive. I had well, no aspirations of wealth mm. or being on covers of magazines or anything like that because I knew that I was going to end up playing some kind of music that wasn't going to afford me that. Mm. I knew I was going to end up playing something that not everybody was going to get. Yeah. And I wouldn't be able to do anything but that. You know, I, we could have very easily have sold out and done something that the label would have supported and paid money for us to get on the radio. And make millions of dollars, and we just couldn't do that. I couldn't do it, you know, because it wouldn't have been with the same job. It would have been a completely different job. Gotcha, man. So, what are the uh, what are the plans for Ninety Six Bitter Beings? I'm patiently awaiting the album, and I know it's pretty much the same lineup as the guys that were on the Foreign Objects album, right? Yeah, I've been with these guys for for almost three years. We did the. We would either Galactic Prey, the Foreign Objects Galactic Prey record. And uh, that was kind of a good introduction to each other. You know, with the, with, with, we have the in-house studio. We have all the best equipment. We have amazing talent. We have, Ken is just an amazing guitar player. Dave Sudak, who helped us, he kind of bridged the gap. He's, with, um, he's in Trapped now. Oh, nice. And uh, he's on tour. Um. <clears throat> we're, uh, you know, we're taking the next step of just doing more of what we wanted to do. They were all fans of, of what we were doing, and now they're involved in it. 
And it's just amazing how one thing, you know, you meet one person who introduces you to that person, and that person shows you this person, and it shows you this guitar, and shows you that amplifier, and then it just kind of builds and builds and builds until you keep working, and you keep the enthusiasm going and the motivation, and then, you know, the fans were very supportive, and they, you know, they paid for the recording. And the record, the record is done. There's one record done. There's another one half done. And they're amazing. They turned out way better than I ever thought they would. So can't wait to hear them. Basically, thank I, I I can't either. <laughs> I'm trying to let go. This is the point of every album where it's time to let go. You have the songs. You have some mixes. Stop trying to better it and add and subtract and take stuff out. There's a point where you have to say to yourself, this is the it, this is it, this is the song, this is the way it's going out, and that's final. That's a, pro- that's a problem I've always had, is letting the song, the album, go. That's a problem Axel's also always had, right? I was just about right? to say, yeah, you're not, this yeah. is not going to be a Chinese democracy, <laughs> uh, 96 Bitter Beginnings, mm-hmm. okay. But the, the, but the thing, the positive thing about not having the resources that Axel had is that there is a chance, there is a, there is a time when you don't have a, a choice. Yeah. And you run out of money, you run out of time, and it's time to let it go and put it out there. Because when you write these songs and you play on these songs and everybody's been listening to them and rehearsing them and doing them over and over and over, you lose what the audience is going to hear when they hear it. Sure. You, can't, you don't have that perspective anymore. So I listen to these songs and I'm like, holy shit, okay, it's loud, it's fat, I can hear everything, the, sing- the singing's good. The, the guitar solos are amazing. The drumming is amazing. It's done, Darren. Let it go. So, literally, that's where I am today. And so, sounds like you're album, in a good place. I'm, I feel like I'm in a good place good. because I'm I'm listening to the songs and there isn't much I can complain about. Nice. And I don't want to complain anymore. I don't want to <laughs> nitpick it. I I just want to love it like I do, and put it out. Yeah, that just tells me you're a great artist, and I'm psyched <laughs> for it, man. Um. I, I got to ask you something as a fellow Kiss nerd. Uh, yeah. What do you think about Vinnie Vincent coming out of hiding for the Atlanta Kiss Expo? Good for him. <laughs> Good for him. You know, I believed all the rumors about Vinnie Vincent, you know. I, I, I fell into the trap. Is he a woman now? Yeah, that is was, he, that is was he the rumor. Around, is oh, he really? in a suit and tie on Wall Street? I mean, there was all kinds <laughs> of stupid rumors. But the the re, the reason I feel ashamed of having believed them is because if never did Vinny come out and say I am not a woman, you know, <laughs> so I shouldn't have believed that stuff. But there wasn't anything to go by, so it's not like I was calling Vinny every day to see how he's doing. <laughs> no one was. Yeah, you know? no one was. So he had it rough. I mean, with Kiss, it's like who's right and who's wrong. You know, Paul Stanley, for all he's worth and for all he's done for me, he still puts things into black and white. Peter, were, Peter and Ace were wrong. I was right. I say they were both wrong, and they were both right. They just knocked heads. They had problems with each other's personality. Neither one of them did the right thing, and neither one of them did the wrong thing. Paul Stanley did what Paul Stanley wanted to do, and Gene did what he wanted to do. And Peter and Ace did what they wanted to do, and that's how the band worked. But later on, when they're shit-talking each other, it's like, well, Peter was wrong for doing this. Well, there was things that Paul was wrong for doing for. Why was Peter Chris doing these horrible things? Because obviously he was doing – Paul Stanley and Gene were doing something that ruffled his feathers. They're not going to admit that, you know? So – in a band situation, it's just like a marriage, except it's two marriages, three marriages sometimes. Yeah. Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, you get one side of the story, you know, we talk to the wife, and she says, oh, well, he did this, and he did that, and he did this. <laughs> you have to ask her, well, why did he do that? What did you do? And you never hear that side. Yeah, very so. true, and that goes into the whole Slash and Axel That's, thing. I was just about to say that. Like, you just don't know <laughs> in that we try to get through the distortion, yeah. and hence the name right. of the, uh, the show. For, for the exactly. record. You guys, are, you, you guys are definitely onto something big there, and I think that there should be, I, I think there should be shows for all bands yeah. because they all have this problem. No, that's true. I, I, I when it comes to that. drugs and stuff, when you're killing yourself, I mean, you're literally killing yourself. Yeah. You can't work with somebody that's doing that. Yeah. 
But even that person that's on their deathbed ready to, to shoot that last fucking shot of heroin in is going to say, I'm doing this because of these guys. Because these guys did this to me. So everybody looks bad. Everybody looks good. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. For the record, I was going to say I've read Paul Stanley's book, which I agree, amazing book. And I read Peter Chris's book. And mm -hmm. I... I loved most of what Paul Stanley had to say, and Peter Chris to me just seemed like a guy who whined a lot, man. I mean, oh, throughout God. that whole book was just like, why am I not getting paid as much as these guys? Well, right. while they were, you know, creating a business, you were getting stoned in a hotel room. Like, what do you expect? Right. But there's two ways of looking at that. There's two ways of looking at that. Peter doesn't have the intelligence of Paul Stanley. Yeah. Peter is a passionate, very sensitive person. In fact, if you look on every page of that book, he's crying somewhere. Yeah. Either, either in the mirror or in his bedroom, he's crying. He's got serious sensitivity issues that are only marred worse and made worse by drugs and alcohol. Like, how can you have sensitivity issues and just be in a band at all for one day with Gene Simmons? Gene Simmons is Gene Simmons. He's <laughs> successful at being Gene Simmons. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to be, but his problem is, is I think he wants to be Donald Trump. I agree. That's, I, I absolutely but, agree. you know, and let him be that. Let him be him. He's not hurting anyone. Until he becomes president of the United States, I guess. It's, president Simmons. Well, it's true on some level. I'm pulling out of my backpack here the new Gene Simmons book, On Power, My Journey Through the Corridors of Power and How You Can Get More, more Power. It looks like the yeah, giant menu at Friday's. He's already put that book out. Yeah, no, I have it in my backpack. Huh? I, I have it in my backpack. <laughs> I you just took it out. It's radio with show and tell. I, I know every single Simmons-ism. I don't need to read another Gene Simmons <laughs> book. That's funny, man. I, so I know how his mind works. I know he thinks he's, – he's a lot like my dad. <laughs> my, dad thinks, my dad thinks of things and excludes the emotional part of it. If I'm having a trouble with somebody, just get rid of them. If they're not doing you any good, get rid of it. But he, do he doesn't have the emotional side of it. It's very Trump. You're right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Gene Simmons is, if this person doesn't work for me, I'm getting rid of them. If this girl doesn't work for me, I'm getting rid of her. It's pretty decent Gene Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I can't help it if I'm going to say what he says. I have to do it in his voice. So last thing I have to ask you about on, a, on another unrelated note, you don't own a cell phone? No. Get by, let us tell us about that because you you were well, there's probably rumors out there that I can't afford one. <laughs> probably rumors out there that I've stolen someone else's. But the the point of it is that I don't. I'm not a phone person. I used to be. I when I was living at home, like 16, 17 years old, I demanded to have my own phone number and my own phone in my room, landline. Because I was doing a band and I wanted to be able to take calls without my parents answering about, you know, oh, can foreign objects play this show? Oh, hold on, let me go get them. You know, I didn't want that. I <laughs> wanted to be able to answer, answer my phone for business reasons. At the time, when I was 17, you know, I was still in high school. Cool. And I had, you know, back then I was a teenager, and I, I had a girlfriend, and I, we would talk for f five, six hours, and that's fine. I can't do that anymore. I, I can't. I cannot talk on the phone unless it's for something, like, this case in point right now, you know, I'm doing an interview to get information out via you guys, via what you're doing. And that's important. So I understand the importance of that. The importance of having a cell phone is distracting. It distracts everybody around me. And I loathe them. I hate them. <laughs> I don't see the point of them. I don't see the importance of having to be available 24 hours, seven days a week. I don't want to type anything into somebody. I don't need to tell somebody happy birthday while I'm driving 80 miles an hour down the four or five. <laughs> it's, it's just it's detrimental. It's an expense that I don't need. It's it's a way of, of people tracking you. Yeah. You know? But what if uh, like Axel Rose sent you a Snapchat saying, hey, do you want to be on that in his <laughs> lifetime? You will miss it. Well, I, you know what? I ha there are official Instagrams and there are official Facebooks, but I do them through the computer. Right. But I don't want to be available 24 hours, seven days a week. I get it, man. I, gotcha. I think that's cool. And I'm not saying like that as, as like a, a musician or an artist. I'm saying it as a person. You know, I like, I like to talk to people that are in front of me. But the problem is they're usually talking to somebody else.
on the phone. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a habit I don't one. I'm not yeah. the only one because I know that Phil Anselmo doesn't have a cell phone. Oh, wow. I know that uh, Vince Vaughn does not have a cell phone, I heard. Really? I mean, I heard. Fair you know, enough. I heard of Vince Vaughn. I know Phil doesn't. <laughs> that's I, cool, I man. Talk, I've, I've seen where other people don't have them because it's like, if you want to get a hold of me, send me an email or come talk to me. Well, speaking or call of- the landline. Speaking of, uh, of getting a hold of you, I was going to say if people want to check out what you're up to on Twitter at 96BB Official, Instagram at 96BitterBeingsOfficial, and Facebook.com slash 96BB Music. I uh, really appreciate you coming on, man. Thank and, you so and much. Just shooting the shit about CKY, about GNR, a little bit about Kiss. Uh, anything else before <laughs> we wrap this up? Well, I just want to tell you guys I think it's incredible that you are the first couple of dudes that have called and wanted to know what happened on that tour. Nobody else in the 15 years has ever wow. said, let's get in touch with CKY and find out what happened because we were not that band. We were not on the charts See, that long. So we were not. I, I still think that's weird to me because I, I, I was in college, you know, early twenties when Axel came back and CKY is just a band. I remember having on my Winamp, Downloading off a of Kazaa or LimeWire or whatever, and it's still remember. It's not like oh here, this uh, '90s like Dishwalla, you know. I, I, I right. It takes me a second to think of Dishwalla, and if right. you if you Google it, you'll recognize that they're one hit. But CKY, I felt I, I, it's, I'm great. It's awesome that we're the first ones, but I find that very surprising given how infamous that tour was for so long until the recent success that they've had. So. Uh, Shane and everybody we else. We were a very, very small Nirvana. Mm. Is how I see it. Well, I'm glad you uh, survived. Two percent of their popularity. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And we don't have. It's not worth getting into legal battles over that name because it doesn't hold any more cultural relevance other than to myself and to a small following. So, so not, cool no Bobby Blotzer's Rat CKY thing for you. Right. And Rat doesn't have – I don't think Rat really has that either. I don't think it's worth it for Rat to go through those feuds and those problems with, and Queensryche and all that stuff because it's just not as valuable as it was. Neither Queensryche is going to do very well anywhere near as close as they did. Neither Rat is going to do as good as they did. So I don't understand the problem. And Quiet Riot's having those issues. All these bands have these issues of who owns what. Who's it doesn't matter. Start over. Your fans only your fans know who you are. If they know who you are and they like you, they will follow you. Everybody that knows who I am knows what I'm doing now, mm. and I want to grab more people because this is a new thing, not an old thing. CKY that name closes more doors than it opens mm. because of all the horrible shit we used to do to people. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. You know. You know, we we didn't cooperate with magazines. We didn't cooperate with the record company. We didn't cooperate with radio. We were totally made fools of ourselves in some cases. There's things that embarrass me. Not no regrets, but there are things that I wish I would have done differently, or not allowed, or maybe you know stepped up and said, "Hey, this this is pretty stupid," you know. So it's dead now. You know, it's dead. And if CK if if I thought CKY was dead when. It was on hiatus. It's certainly dead now. So just be who I am. Be an artist. Write songs that CKY fans liked, you know, and will like. And I, I'm very confident that they will dig the new stuff a lot. I'm confident in that uh, as well. And I guess the last question for me then, I want to get your pers- uh, perspective based upon everything that you said. Uh, how do you feel about Stone Temple Pilots? Because they're in the Guns N' Roses uh, world, I guess, things that we, we've spoken about them, of course, uh, with Velvet Revolver and things of that nature. Uh, but it's they haven't started uh, the tour yet with their new singer, Jeff Goot, but, of course, uh, their mm-hmm. their last two lead singers. Uh, the, which, is, which says yeah. something about them. It's a, it, it's hard. Kind of a, yeah, I mean, that, that. you never know. I mean, I, I got to imagine, you know, are they – are they kind no, of amplifying it, what the, the diseases? It's Def that... Leppard, dude. It's just bad luck. Yeah. You know, drummer loses an arm, drummer, or guitar player drinks himself to death. No, it's it's bad luck. There's cer- certainly nothing going on in Stone Temple Pilots. I mean, you can, just, it's a sense, it's my sense of humor, yeah. You know, what are those guys doing? You know, that's, it's not funny. I mean, but I mean, obviously people are online saying, probably blaming somebody from Stone Temple Pilots. 
you know. But, oh, sure, that's know, happened. That's being a fan. Be, hating the band is part of being a fan. And I'll go on record as saying that I was the first troll. Because I used to get in touch when the internet first came out and I got the first computer. I used to troll people that I loved and told them how much I hated them. <laughs> <laughs> because if I told them that I loved them, I knew they wouldn't respond. You see? <laughs> okay. And that's all it is now. That's all it is now. All the stuff that goes online, all the things that everybody can say whatever they want now. And they only are going to say negative stuff about a band that they love because they want that person in that band that they're digging at to get in touch with them. And, of course, now it's so overdone that you can't even follow and read all this stuff because everybody's doing it. It's just not effective anymore. All I right. think if you like a band, you should be honest. You should say, I love what you're doing. If you have an opinion or something you don't like is going on, you can say that too. But don't expect anybody to read it or don't expect anybody to change because of it. You know. So I just try to I, I just try to be positive because being positive on the internet is is the thing that should be growing stronger. Especially in the you world know? of rock, I think right now that just really needs a push, especially here in America. The world of rock is a, just a small world now. It's just it's it's one percent of what it used to be. You know. And it's sad because there's no new bands. It's all like Nickelodeon girls can sing all of a sudden. Yeah. Once they hit, once they grow some tits, they're they're recording in the studio. <laughs> You're right. But that's pretty much what it is. It's like ten year old girls on this show in Nickelodeon for eight years. They sign her off. She, you know, she's got a hot body now. Put her in the studio. Fix her voice. It's true. And that's pretty much what music is now. If you look at the top 200 Billboard, it's all names of people. Or even uh, what's uh, uh, the girl that was on Dr. Phil? I'm forgetting her experience saying. Oh, oh the, anybody. Ca uh, cash Me Outside. Cash Me Outside girl fuck was on me Atlantic for Records. That. Yeah, fuck me for knowing that, by the way. And fuck her. Yeah. <laughs> well, how, how can you avoid it? <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I just wish I could. How of can you avoid it? Uh, it sucks. And that's why it's awesome still to have people like you carrying the uh, rock <laughs> Thank flag. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that. You know, still doing it. And it's it's what you said, what you wanted. You wanted to be doing this uh, and yeah. making a living at it. So you're living your dream, which is just amazing. It's all I can do. It's, I'm not, I know I'm good at this. I know I can succeed at this. I'm not going to tell you that I'm a, a very good uh, theater person. I'm not a d good director of movies. If you, put me, if you made me direct the movie, it would probably turn out like shit because I know <laughs> what I can do and what I can't do. But and, you, and your wife is an actress. So. But then you'll have James Franco yeah. make a movie about your shitty movie and be even more famous. <laughs> if he has done that, I wouldn't know. Oh, uh, well, I guess he, like, he doesn't have a phone, so why would I expect him to know about the room and the, the disaster artist? Sorry, never mind. <laughs> if there was more going on that appealed to me, I'd probably have a phone. Okay. <laughs> well, you are allowed to call in to the AFD show whenever you uh, you want when you have That's a phone great. on you. And uh, if you're ever in New York City, meet us face to face. That would be amazing. Hopefully, we'll be on tour next year, and we'll hit New York, and I'll get to see you and many many others. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate That's it, man. My, That's my dream. That's well. Let's uh let's ride that rainbow. Why? Where did that come from? I don't even know why I said that. That was weird. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it makes sense. Don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> uh, Darren, it, it's so cool to talk to you, and uh, thanks for, Ian, for you. setting this up. And uh, the fact that we set this up through Facebook is so cool. It goes back to my first radio interview ever when I interviewed mm -hmm. Bumblefoot, and I set it up through MySpace. So sometimes that's how it works. Social media yeah. can be bad. Sometimes it's good. I'm on Facebook. You can find my name. You can find I let anybody follow me. I don't, I don't care. It's just As soon as you start a fight, you're gone. That's just the way. Those are the rules for me. You know, good rule. But I am available. I'll talk to anybody. You know, I like to help solve problems. If somebody has a problem, and I give <laughs> good advice as I can. You know, that's, that's what great. I try to do. Very cool. Appreciate that, it, man. That you're so accessible, uh, despite not having a <laughs> cell you. phone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Darren. I'm more accessible without one. So. Yeah, it seems like that. You're happier without one. I'd probably have it on vibrate the whole time. <laughs> Darren, thank you again, and uh, enjoy your day. You're calling us from from where again? California, Los Angeles. All right, so you enjoy your day. You still plenty of football. I don't know. Well, you say you're not a sports guy, but I was going to say enjoy your football Sunday, but you don't care. <laughs> I will enjoy the Sunday. Okay, enjoy the Sunday regardless. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think I'd be able to get the game on the TV anyway. <laughs> oh, TV you, doesn't really work. Much. Do you actually have like a uh, a real TV, or do you have rabbit ears too? Oh, we got a ton of TVs. Okay. No, they're all they're all current. 
All right, I just want to make but, sure how far back you were. Well, like I said, too, no, when your Blu-ray's, wife is like an actress. DVD, Blu-rays, DVD, and Netflix. Gotcha. Yeah. That's all I am. Because awesome. like I said, Felissa Rose, Darren's wife, um, there's probably a whole other audience who has seen her work. So. Oh, yeah. Which is pretty She's cool. doing very well right now. She's producing a lot and acting and a lot going on. Very cool. Awesome, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate Thanks so it, much. Man. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Um. So as you guys may know, if you listen to uh, the last show, this is my final appetite for distortion. Mm. And it was uh, it was a cool way to end it, though, for me, because I couldn't have thought of anyone better than Darren Miller to have on. I mean, personally, I really mean this is probably in my top five favorite songwriters. You know, he downplays the career of CKY. but Yeah, I was surprised at that. Yeah, what's really interesting to me is the fact that um, – you know, he wrote all of those songs. Like, it, it's not even a band. It's, like, solely him. So it's kind of, I get his whole feeling towards it. It's like the Beach Boys touring without Brian Wilson. Yeah. You know, he created everything. Um, and I think he's just an amazing songwriter. I actually have a slight disagreement with uh, the value of the name. Because, you know, no, on, I agree. on rock radio, you could still put out CKY. And, and the average fan who is like, you know, like you maybe saying, oh, I remember those guys. They don't know who's in the band still, and they'll probably go out and see them if they're like, oh, I'm not doing anything tonight. CKY is playing at a bar by me? Cool. Right. You know, and they, and they also got on the final tour with him, uh, you know, the band him. Yes. So I, I think— And they it, broke up, I believe, recently. Yeah. And Well, this is their final tour. Okay, that's it, right. Yeah, so if it wasn't the name recognition of CKY, I don't think they'd be on that tour— and it's interesting because people have said to me, oh, you're not going to go see CKY on that tour. And for me, it's like air quotes CKY. It's not CKY without Darren. So, I, you know, I'm excited to hear what he puts out, though, because as he said, he's worked on a million different projects. And I really suggest everybody check them out because I, I love them all. Um, so he put out an acoustic album, uh, Acoustified, Darren Miller. And it's all these songs that he did acoustically by himself. Sound great, like CKY songs, foreign object songs. Um, foreign objects put out an album called galactic prey awesome very heavy stuff and then really heavy put out a death metal album uh for his band world under blood and they're they're excellent I, as i said to him i'm not really a death metal fan because i never liked that there's no clean vocals in death metal yeah i'm and with you he you know he does the death metal growl and also the clean vocals and it sounds amazing so Check out World Under Blood, and I'm excited for 96 Bitter Beings. I mean, the man is constantly working on new music. <laughs> and I said to, uh, to Ian, who do you want on your last show? And this is something I think we probably spoke about. Uh, Darren, we interview, uh, to, We spoke about interviewing him since we started this show. Yeah. So well, you is... talked about interviewing CKY, and I was like, it's not CKY without him. So. Well, I guess it yeah. was... I didn't know that, so you. Could, I mean, my premise was still right. Oh yeah, but I'm yeah. just saying, like, I was more excited to interview him than the other guys. I just, I, you oh, know, that I, did. I mean, regardless, it didn't matter. I mean, I hate to say, it, I mean, now I'm glad we spoke to Darren and I learned more about him since you've taught me more, more about him. So I agree with the decision as opposed to whoever's in CKY now. Yeah, not that. How, it, I mean, I think they'd be a great future guest. Oh but, sure, sure, yeah. and it, but it's I wanted somebody, and I was in shock that we're the first people to ask him about the Chinese democracy tour in 15 years, especially since I saw an article th- uh, this year about the 15th anniversary. Yeah. I mean, anything Guns N' Roses now is clickbait. You want it, so why wouldn't you want to reach out to CKY? I mean, that's, you know, for honestly, that's a plan of mine going forward uh, with different interviews, different bands who have opened up for GNR. Yeah, and I you think get their a perspective. Lot. So, I mean, I'm shocked. Yeah. Shocked, a, I said. A lot of the openers get ignored. Uh, the one thing that... That people remember that are, you know, in the GNR camp and is when Eagles of Death Metal opened. and The, you, the Pigeons of Shit Metal? Yeah, they even, they even put out a shirt that says Pigeons of Shit Metal. Yeah, yeah. So it was like people remember that, and I guess that goes back to people remembering the negative because it sounds like they went over pretty well at those shows. He's a very honest guy. I was expecting and, negative, and, you know, he the fact that he didn't know why they were late is 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 interesting. Uh, it sounds like there's certain stuff he kept a little tight-lipped about because he doesn't seem like a guy who's going to talk shit about. It's possible, a band with. but the, I mean, you're right. We, I could be being naive, and maybe stuff did happen. But he seems to still be very appreciative and, and just spoke really well of him. I thought we were going to get some maybe crazy Axel story, <laughs> yeah. But the, other than he's the first and last one at the party, 
I guess that's about it. I think he could relate to it because Darren has been labeled the same way as like that guy in CKY as Axel has in Guns N' Roses. You know, not to rehash things, but you could look up the history of, you know, the band and their last show. And there was a lot of negative stuff that went down. And there's been a lot of negative things said about Darren. And I, so I get how he could relate to that. Right. And that was another interesting perspective to talk to him about, in addition to just, of course, being on that tour in 2002. So, uh, you know, I hope he does uh, call, call back or, or come back in a future episode. If Ian, you want a guest to uh, you know, make a cameo yeah. uh, to meet him, uh, you you are allowed to oh, do that. Oh, in studio, he'd be cool, man. I yeah. would definitely like to meet him. Um, so I guess, yeah, wrapping up, if, if I'm wrapping this one up, uh, this has been an awesome ride. I mean, I've I, I, I went out and created this podcast with Brando and you know you never know like how big something's gonna get and it's so cool to see like this worldwide fan base that's checking us out you know it's a smaller worldwide fan base but it's cool to get these messages from all different people who really value what we do and for me I'm just ready to move on to some other projects and uh, those are in the works so if you if you want to see what I'm going to be up to post appetite for distortion uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Ian Scotto I try not to post, like, incessantly, and I'm also not going to be one of those people who's like, big announcement coming soon. If I have an announcement, you'll see it, and I have a bunch of things in store for 2017. So when it happens, I promise you guys will be the first to know. Um, also, Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Ian Scotto Radio. And as always, I'll be doing soft rep radio twice a week, producing The Power of Thought every week with Brandon Webb. And, uh, yeah, and working on other endeavors. But this has been really cool, man. It's been, like, what, a year and a half? And we've watched this thing build. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know our we both, we're both in radio, but our careers have been a little bit different. You know, I went on the on-air route. Uh, yeah. And it's what this podcast has done for me. It's given me more creativity, and I've gotten more satisfaction, honestly, out of it instead of being the guy who talks between – you know, Zeppelin and the Stones, yeah. you know, the same songs you've been playing for 40 years. Uh, but with you, when you suggested a podcast, and it was something that I thought about doing for a while because it's so big, you know, like, let's do a GNR podcast. I kind of laughed at you. and uh, But just knowing the knowledge that you brought to me with podcasting and where it's going, I'm really glad to be involved in it now, and especially with a project like this, because the fan base does grow every episode. Uh, you know, a new email from a new region of the world every episode. Uh, the the certain caliber of guests that we've had. Uh, it's just been very cool, so that's why I want to continue. You know, I'm fortunate enough that I'm able to do this podcast sort of while at work. Yeah. Uh, and, and MacGyver it, so it's not taking too much time away from me. Uh, but And I know that's why, because you want to devote more time to different things, but that's yeah. why I feel... Going forward, you've helped give me uh, – we've built a nice base. I will say I'm not changing the logo uh, unless something <laughs> crazy happens because in the well, vein – shout out to Aaron who did the logo okay. in Australia, man. He's he's awesome. And actually, I'm going to try to work with Aaron on some future stuff because I really love the job he did for us. I mean, yeah. For someone for me to just like explain what we wanted and him make that logo as quickly as he did with like the turnaround, I was really blown away. So I have other things I'm going to be using graphics for in the future, and like Aaron is going to be my go to guy. I thought he did an amazing job, actually. But, but I don't want to change it just it. because GNR never changed it, so I got to keep in the same you know vein as Guns N' Roses. Yeah, that's fine. Keep it. Plus, you, we made too many stickers, and I have to still give them out. Oh so. yeah, I still have a bunch. If you want them, I should give a shout out though to Aaron just because. Because, you know, if we're talking about his graphics, he really did it. Yeah, and he made the, um, uh, the Ninja Turtles uh, font for us as well. Yeah. So and- that's going to continue. I mean, and I told Ian, you know, because I've known about him leaving for months already. Uh, if he wants to be the Izzy Stradlin of this podcast and show up whenever he wants, he's more than willing. But, you know, if and when this podcast uh, makes money, you are not going to get a fair share. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll be like Peter Chris. Um, so just to or give, Izzy. <laughs> to give, well, Izzy seems like he's done well, man. But I know, but he's, he's not songwriting. making the same as Axel and Slash. Yeah, so. he's got songwriting credits. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, so just to give Aaron a free plug, because I think he did an amazing job with our graphics, um, Facebook uh, at Aaron Lauder Design. So that's facebook.com slash Aaron, L-O-D-D-E-R, design. Um, you know, if anyone wants to steal our graphics guy, I, I really don't mind giving him other work because, like, he he's such a quick turnaround and does an amazing job. And 
didn't overcharge me. And uh, so, yeah. Well, she, this is all part of the people that not only we've interviewed, but people we've come across, you know, making the logo for us or uh, Collar Pop sending us those pins. Oh, yeah, those are cool. You know, it's just been it's been really overwhelming and really cool. And I told you, as sad as it is to see you go, I enjoy working with you. I'm exo- uh, excited. It's excited. cool, though, man. I'm excited not, to see where this goes. I'm, I'm – uh, I'm always like my personality type is I'm always ready for like the next thing and the next project. And I don't want to always be working on like the same thing. That's just me. Um, I, you know, we were talking about Jim Carrey uh, and the Jim and Andy documentary before. And it was like after he did that Andy Kaufman movie, uh, Man on the Moon, he was like, all right, I'm done with this. Moving on to the next thing. I'm very much the same way. And like when I feel like this this thing has reached whatever I wanted it to. I'm ready to do something new and I have like all these new things in mind. And it's like, as soon as I get done with this show, I'm going to get started with all these new things because I like had it in my head that I was like, I'm going to keep this as the last thing on my plate to, uh, to accomplish in 2017. And then I'm fucking ready for 2018. So, uh, yeah, man, it's been, it's been really cool. And I've, I've met new people because of this show and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still around. I'm not going anywhere as a person. You're d- he's dying. <laughs> and I'll still be talking about Guns N' Roses all the time, man. I, I love GNR. Like, I wouldn't be able to talk for, you know, every other week about something so passionately if I wasn't into them. Like, I could talk GNR every day. I mean, that they're way more than a band to me. Aw, that's adorable. And for me— They are, man. They're no, more than a band to you. Yes, I know, I know they are. And uh, I'm going to continue the, uh, the platform that some— not Guns N' Roses directly has given me, but somehow it's provided me, inspired me to make uh, us to make this podcast. So I, I think there is a long way, a lot of things that we can do, a lot of conversations uh, that we can have. Um, you know, if you've been following us, trying to get more creative with the interviews, create more creative with the content, um, different people on. So it's just been, I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes for me, 2018. Cool, man. It's, uh, so, uh, Ian. Uh, I won't. I'll hug you once we. No, I won't. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not. You won't see me again. No, I know. We, we were here in New York. I'm not moving no, anywhere. No, we we we're gonna go out. We have to go to concerts together. Yeah. Uh, so as far as the next episode, unless you have anything else to share, my no, dear. No, concerts you were talking about. I might. Uh, I'm debating if I'm gonna go see Glassjaw. Uh, the day before New Year's Eve. That could be a cool show. Uh, yeah, and no, I'll still be going to shows and all that shit. I'm, so. I'm thinking about going to uh, Monster Magnet in in, in Jersey. I know our mutual friend, Mike Binns, who actually is the guy kind of responsible for getting me in the CKY, um, is a fan of theirs. Uh, I honestly, off the top of my head, couldn't even tell you a song. I remember they had one big hit, right? They're they one hit wonder kind of. Uh, Space Lord. See, I, I, I probably I wouldn't, I wouldn't know it, man. Yeah, you would if you heard it. All right. Yeah. No, I think they were more. Yeah. So Space Lord. I think they uh, another tune. Uh, who was in my room last night that was on Guitar Hero that ended up being pretty big. Uh, but I mean, yeah, they're, to me, they're like a CKY where like, I know who they are. I would go see a show. I know a handful of songs. They're not like Guns N' Roses to me where I know everything. Of course. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. So, uh, I will see you, Ian, at another time, another place, another, yes, sir. another planet. Uh, but as far as the next episode of Appetite for Distortion is concerned, when will you see it? Well, in the words of Axl Rose concerning Chinese democracy, I don't know if soon is the word. But you'll see it. You've been listening to the distorted minds of Brando and Scotto, dissecting all things Guns N' Roses on Appetite for Distortion. Follow the guys on Twitter at The AFD Show and on Facebook at facebook.com slash The AFD Show. security, I'm going home.